at the news and they said from Lima to Santiago. And I knew in that plane, Kenny and Abraham were flying. The news was very vague, so they mentioned there might be some survivors and they mentioned that the, the plane crashed on the Pacific Ocean and, and they didn't have a lot of uh, news and the crash was at night. So in my mind, I thought that the plane sort of landed on water and, and most people got out. Guido Fernandez has just been appointed Peru's accident investigator. Aero Peru is his first case. The co-pilot, David Fernandez, is his nephew. I was in bed. It was uh, about 4.30 in the morning. And they called me. Your nephew uh, is lost in an airplane. They asked me, I mean, how do you feel that your nephew was a co-pilot? My gosh, I, I feel very bad. But I'm a professional. I have to do a job. I have to comply uh, and complete my, my duty. So uh, that's what I did. Fernandez rushes to the crash site in a Navy helicopter. It is clear there are no survivors. Nine bodies are floating in the debris. The rest sank with the 757. Fernandez puts thoughts of his nephew out of his mind. His job is to retrieve the aircraft's flight data and voice recorders to determine what happened. He needs help. Fernandez contacts the National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, D.C., one of the world's leading agencies for air accident investigation. They had found the aircraft. It was uh, pretty well documented by radar. Uh, the Navy, the Peruvian Navy, had uh, uh, gotten a uh, fix on the flotsam and the wreckage in the ocean. And um, the only uh, thing left to do was find it on the bottom of the ocean, which they did not have the facilities for. Rodriguez flies to Lima to join Guido Fernandez in his effort to find answers. When I found out that his nephew was the first officer, I suggested that perhaps they should consider removing uh, Captain Fernandez from the investigation because of emotional involvement and what have you. The American investigator's concerns soon vanish. He was uh, very objective, I would say an excellent investigator, considering that it was, and not a distant nephew, I mean, it was his very close relative. Uh, he, um, he did a, an outstanding job. The black box in the Boeing 757 can emit a locator beacon for 30 days. The U.S. Navy provides underwater remote-operated vehicles to survey the debris field, seeking the black boxes. It is clear to the veteran investigator Rodriguez that the plane went down in one piece. I've done in-flight breakups that were spread over 15, 16 miles and maybe a mile and a half wide, which tells you instantly that the, I mean, just what you know of the looking at the wreckage that this thing didn't hit in one piece. It clearly was disintegrating as it was uh, crashing. But in this case, it was a fairly tight debris field. And uh, so obviously it hit at high speed and um, was fairly closely knit uh, wreckage pattern. The data recorders are retrieved from the 757. Brought to the surface, the boxes are placed in coolers full of fresh water to keep them from oxidizing. They are swept back to Washington for analysis at the NTSB. The cockpit voice recorder might offer the evidence investigators seek. Every word spoken by pilots Schreiber and Fernandez and every unnerving alarm is recorded on audio tape. The recorded voices are faint, sometimes hard to make out. 
but the chaos in the cockpit rings through with chilling clarity. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. The tape is digitized into a computer, filtered and enhanced. It was clear to us that uh, there were, they were really experiencing a problem with airspeed and altitude. And um, the airspeed and altitude indications in the aircraft are a, strictly a function of the, what we call the pitot-static system. The pitot-static system is found on all aircraft, large or small. External ports measure outside air pressure to provide data on altitude and speed. If these ports are obstructed, the plane's computers generate false warnings. But why these ports would be blocked is a mystery. Robotic vehicles are deployed to find the missing piece of the puzzle. Investigators are stunned to discover that Captain Schreiber's static port is completely blocked with tape. Just before Aero Peru 603 lifted off from Lima, maintenance workers cleaned the aircraft. A worker covered the static ports with tape to protect them. This is standard procedure, but he forgot to remove the tape. It was a small oversight with catastrophic results. The taping was never removed. And when the airplane uh, departed and, and started to fly, nothing but trapped static uh, sea level air pressure was sensed by those instruments. And in a matter of fact, the airplane was climbing up in the thinner air. And the, um, uh, the information presented on the instruments and to the air data computer was false which generated uh, just totally non-normal readings. The inspector who was supposed to quality check his work did not do it. And the supervisor out on the line that night was not there, he was sick, and there was a, uh, a regular mechanic who was filling that role. He did not see it. And the captain or the pilot, in this case, the captain did the pre-flight. Um, they do a walk around looking for just that kind of thing. Um, the captain did the pre-flight that night, and he did not detect it either. A little piece of paper with glue caused an accident. But the paper and the glue are not to blame. Humans are to blame, because humans use that tape in the wrong place for the wrong purpose. An accident shockingly similar to Aero Peru Flight 603 happened with another 757 just eight months earlier. In February 1996, 189 people die when a German charter called Bergen Air crashes after takeoff near Puerto Plata, Dominican Republic. The NTSB assists in the investigation. A survey of the wreckage reveals that one pitot tube, the other critical part of the pitot static system, is blocked. As with Aero Peru 603, night is the pilot's worst enemy. The Bergen Air pilot flips the plane upside down before crashing into the sea. 